This is Justin with Style of Substance. There have been many iterations of the blind man in an elephant, or the elephant in the dark parable, throughout history. But the one I am perhaps most familiar with is the version told by Sufi poet and Islamic scholar Rumi. As he tells the story in his poem, men walk into the dark individually, and each feel a different part of an elephant's body. They state what they believe to have felt, but each man is wrong in their assessment. The ear is mistaken to be a fan, the trunk to be a water spout, the leg to be a pillar, and the back to be a throne. With this story, Rumi calls attention to the limitations of individual perception. Gus Van Sant's 2003 film Elephant takes the general idea of this parable and applies it to a fictionalized retelling of the Columbine High School Massacre, but sets the story in Portland instead. The film follows regular American high school students, played by regular American high school students, during their last hours at school before the massacre unfolds. Told through a series of long shots and repeated scenes from differing perspectives, the viewer comes to see these people for who they are at this moment without truly knowing them. We are not given substantial context, yet we come to our own conclusions by what they do in the moment and also by how others perceive them. Ultimately, though, our perceptions are, and always will be, limited. There is so much we do not know about others. Prior to the massacre, we experience the calm before the storm. A shot of the clouds presents a colorful, though not quite bright, view of the world. Eli takes pictures of others for his portfolio, without knowing that these photographs will preserve the last moments of his peers fading glimpses into the lives that will soon come to an end. John arrives late to school, only to be scolded by an authority figure and sent to his office. What the man fails to understand, though, is what goes on in the student's life outside the school. His father is an alcoholic and is difficult to handle, but is loved regardless. Yet, John's personal life is disregarded. The moment is brief and subtle, but gives us enough insight to put the pieces together. Yeah, Dad's drunk again. No, so, he, Mr. Hey. McFarland. Hi, Mr. Lewis. No. I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, my, my dad took me out to lunch. I mean, Meet breakfast. me in my office. Yeah, I'm in trouble now. Michelle feels insecure about her body, uncomfortable with wearing what is expected of her during physical education. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to give you a mark against you either, but I'm going to have to do it if you can't show up in shorts like you're supposed to. Students like John and Michelle must conform to the system. Brittany, Jordan, and Nicole speak about seemingly superficial things and constantly cut each other off, never allowing the viewer, or each other for that matter, to really know more about their individual experiences. Yet, all three girls, collectively, have a unified issue, evident as they casually walk into the bathroom stalls and vomit the food they just ate for lunch only minutes ago. A gay straight alliance meeting takes place. It is questioned whether people can ever truly know whether someone is one way or another if they do not openly profess it to be the case. Would wearing a rainbow bracelet give away one's orientation, or is this symbolic association a mere social construction, an arbitrary one at that, only bound to break in due time? <laughs> well, and then, so, and then why, why would it even matter? Like, why, I mean, you're wearing a bracelet and you're not gay, and, you know, who cares either way? As the subjects walk, the shots linger, intersect, and parallel each other, all coalescing into tragedy meaningless tragedy. Following the footsteps of Alan Clark's 1989 TV film of the same name, Elephant depicts death in a cold and detached manner. One moment these students are alive and well, and in the next they are gone. All that is left is their cold and bleeding corpses. Hey, you guys Clark's film provides virtually no context for the murders depicted, framing them all as anyone's guess. 
Characters walk and drive to different locations, shooting one person after another. As the shooter leaves the site, the camera holds on the bodies of the victims. And while Gus Van Sant often mimics Clark's model of presenting on-screen violence, he also deviates from it. He provides some context, or at the very least, what can be perceived as such, if we have enough faith. What has led these two kids to murder numerous innocents? Is it the neglect from their adult authorities, family life at home, persistent bullying, repressed homosexuality, mental illness, the influence of media and violent video games? The answer is all of them and none of them. We do not know. We might not ever know. What rational justification could there possibly be for carrying out such an atrocity and doing so at such a young age? It's, it's in our interest to, to identify the reason why so that we can feel safe, you know? We can identify the reason why so that we can feel that we're not part of it, you know? That it's demonized and that it's uh, identified um, and controlled. If, if we knew, if we were positive about reasons why we thought this happened specifically, um, that we'd probably have put them in. You know, but, we, but it was always so elusive, exactly why. We cannot shift blame on one specific thing. Society is too complex, paradoxical, and multifaceted for the answer to be this simple. For all intents and purposes, these suggestions of influence are the parts of this elephant in the dark. The shooters Eric and Alex are detached from the possible influences. They barely recognize Hitler in the documentary they watch. Their love for each other is artificial. Their heads appear to be as clear as other students. And they more or less carry the same emotional baggage. Their frustrations with the education system are shared with their peers. Their sexual orientation could be accepted by others. They play violent video games but so do many innocent people. Matters are not that simple. But they do treat the massacre like a video game. When that goes, we should be able to, you know, pick off kids as we traverse the East Wing, right? At about that time, there should be kids flushing all out in all directions, and we'll just be able to pick them off one by one. They treat their peers as moving targets, and their teachers as bosses. The most important thing for them is to have fun. Most importantly, have fun, man. Yeah, man. Eric expresses his frustrations with his teacher, gives him false hope, and tells him to run away. Get out of here before I change my mind. Go! But he guns him down like the rest. <laughs> Bitch. However, these hands that cause death and destruction are the same hands that can create something calm and beautiful. As cynical as a lot of this is, Gus Van Sant expresses some level of hope for humanity, as short and subtle as it may be. John tries stopping students and teachers from entering the building. Benny saves a student from her potential doom. He attempts to confront the shooters, but gets slaughtered just like the rest. Anyway, Mr. Lewis, whatever. There is no triumphant moment, no winning here, because this is a film about death and tragedy, not success and catharsis. Alex even kills Eric. I shot the principal and some other people and... Nothing matters to the shooter. It's all meaningless. The film comes to a close with Alex playing Eeny Meeny Miny Mo, leaving who lives and who dies between the two students up to chance. Though odds are, he'll shoot both of them anyway.
We see another shot of the clouds, but the color is distorted. The storm continues onward as the credits roll. We may never come to understand events and people like these through our individual and biased perceptions, but we can at least broaden our attempts at understanding by looking for answers together instead of mindlessly rambling on and talking past each other. What good does that do? Rumi's poem about the elephant in the dark ends as follows. If each of the men had a candle and went into the dark together, the differences in perception would disappear. Special thanks to my patron, Yakov Ejanoi. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing and sharing my work around. If you really enjoy what I do and want to be included in my credits, consider donating to my Patreon. Given the subject matter of some of my videos, I am not sure how good my chances of channel monetization really are, but I'll continue making content that I want to make, and any help is more than appreciated. I have more videos on the way, so stick around. Bye-bye.